Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Division of Tribal Affairs, I'd like to welcome everyone to an All Tribes Consultation webinar. My name is Michaela Holm, and I work with Kaufman & Associates, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is titled um, Telehealth and COVID-19. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight the main features of our Zoom webinar interface. First, the presentation slides will appear in the main window while the speakers will appear in the top corner. At the bottom of your screen is the menu bar. Here you'll find the chat, raise hand, Q&A, and closed captioning functions. Please use the chat box to report any technical issues you are experiencing, and we'll respond to these concerns as they come in. Next, the chat box is the raise hand feature. You'll be able to use this during the Q&A segment to let us know when you'd like to unmute your mic and you can ask a question at that time. Another way you're able to submit questions at any time during the webinar is at the Q&A box itself where you can leave your questions at any point during the presentation and we'll address these at the end. Lastly, live captioning is available for today's broadcast. Simply click on the CC icon to use this feature. Please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that all recordings will be made available online in the near future on cms.gov. This webinar series is supported by an award by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And at this time, I will pass it to Beverly Lofton. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you so much. For that opening. Um, well, good afternoon. I'm Beverly Lofton. I'm a senior policy advisor in the Division of Tribal Affairs here at CMS. Um, welcome to our web webinar. During today's webinar, our presenter will highlight Medicare and Medicaid telehealth flexibilities during the public health emergency, recent data on utilization on telehealth services, policy changes that impact American Indians and Alaska Natives, and future telehealth opportunities. A copy of the PowerPoint from today can be downloaded from the spotlight page of the CMS American Indians and Alaska Native Outreach and Education website, and that can be found at go.cms.gov at AIAN. So we are pleased to be joined by Abigail Walsh. And at this point, I will turn the webinar over to Abby. Abby? to begin the presentation. Thank you, Bev. Thanks for that great introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby. I am a health insurance specialist student trainee with the Division of Tribal Affairs, and I will be here today to talk to you all about telehealth during the COVID-19 PHE. In addition to the slides being available, I do want to let you all know that I have made an accompanying report that is also available at that same web page that Bev just um, mentioned for you all. And there will be information that I touch on today that's in that report, but more in-depth information than what I can even cover today. So you might hear me mention the report here and there throughout the presentation. Just know you do have access to that, and I highly encourage everyone to check it out. Um, so without further ado, if I could head to the next um, slide, thank you. Um, so before we dive in, I wanted to just start out defining what telehealth is. Um, and really telehealth, it's an important health technology that can connect patients um, to their providers when they physically cannot um, meet together in the same space. And there are a few different modalities um, that are recognized as telehealth that I'll define here for you today. The first is two-way audiovisual, and that's exactly what it sounds like. It is where you can both hear and see patient and provider. Um, typically, a provider will have an online health system or a portal that the patient will log on to, so it's a secure manner for the patient and the provider to have that telehealth appointment, um, but it works like a Zoom or a FaceTime um, call. <laughs> Audio only is simply a phone call. So patient and provider can't see one another, but they're having their appointment via phone call. 
and store and forward. So this is an electronic transmission of patient information from patient to provider. So an example could be maybe a patient is experiencing a rash and they want to send a photo of it to their provider to get some insight as to what might be going on. They would use store and forward technology to send that. Um, remote patient monitoring is when a patient's health data is collected outside of the clinic, usually through a wearable technology. So maybe a heart monitor or blood sugar levels being tracked. And those are electronically submitted, again, through a portal back to the provider. And that allows the provider to aid in clinical decision making. An e-visit is a non-face-to-face -face patient and provider interaction, and it's usually through um, messaging through a portal. So again, a lot of this is done through a secure portal that the physician's office runs, um, and this is a time if a patient has a follow-up question for an appointment or just needs to ask their provider something, they can do so through this portal. And the last modality is called a virtual check-in. And this is a very brief patient initiated, um, usually a phone call, but a communication from the patient to the provider to determine if a visit is needed. So the, again, very brief, essentially the patient may say, hey, I'm having XYZ concern and the doctor or the provider can on the line say, you know what, you need to come in, we need to schedule a telehealth appointment or whichever, you know, whatever they may decide. Um, so those are the different modalities. Um, and the next thing, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, would um, be to discuss telehealth utilization. So um, I wanna spend some time just to give you all information about what trends and utilization have looked like during the PHE. So next slide, please. Thank you. So this first slide um, is to show the Medicare trends of telehealth. Um, and what the top box tells us is essentially how many Medicare beneficiaries were using telehealth prior to the PHE and what those numbers looked like um, once the PHE began. And I think it's really important to note, you'll see there in that total, that we were just shy of a million Medicare beneficiaries using telehealth pre-PHE in the year before the PHE began. Um, and a year, a full year of the PHE going on um, almost, or a little over 28 million users. So that is, you know, a huge jump. Um, of course, it wasn't safe for many people to go into the office, but as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there were a lot of expansions to telehealth policy um, for Medicare beneficiaries, which greatly allowed, uh, greatly expanded the access that allowed more patients to utilize the um, telehealth services with their providers. I do want to make a quick note because you might, you know, be wondering why some of the visits for e-visits and virtual check-ins were so low pre-PHE. Um, the e-visits were not um, Medicare reimbursable until the year 2020 and virtual check-ins until 2019. So telehealth, um, it, which was a video, audio-visual only modality, was the main source of telehealth for several years until 2019 and 2020 when virtual check-ins and e-visits became available. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this um, shows the percent of Medicare users who were using a telehealth service um, through the various quarters from 2020 into the first quarter of 2022. So we do have some data for the beginning of this year. As you can see, between the second and the third quarter of 2020, we saw a massive spike. Um, of course, it's when the PHE began um, and patients were utilizing telehealth services at a very high level. Over time, that number has come down as it's become safer for patients to go into the office for their appointments. But you can see even into the beginning of this year, um, the level of Medicare um, beneficiaries using a telehealth service still remained quite high compared to pre-PHE levels. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this does a breakdown and I wanted to show, and I apologize if it's a little small on your screen, but the green line actually represents American Indian Alaska Native Medicare beneficiaries who were utilizing telehealth services. And I wanted to share this with you all um, just to show that, um, especially for the first year, um, the amount of AIA and beneficiary, Medicare beneficiaries, excuse me, um, compared to other race and, race and ethnicities was quite high. As the um, PHE's time has gone on, um, the levels have come down, but are still, you know, within like the average of all of the groups. Um, 
which in a few minutes, we'll actually talk about IHS and tribal clinic um, specific telehealth data. But I just wanted to show this um, just to share with you all to see if, you know, if anyone was curious about how AIANs um, compared to other beneficiary groups. Um, and so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this slide, this is our Medicaid and CHIP slide. Um, so this is a little bit different. The Medicare highlighted the amount of users, um, whereas this tells us the amount of telehealth services. So the trends you'll actually notice are very similar, but it, I do want to just compare that they're comparing different things, excuse me. Um, and then please note, this does not include any dual eligible. So this does not take in data for patient, patients who have both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but just like Medicare, we see a big spike um, in April of 2020 um, when the PHE first began. Um, and over time, the number has gone down. Um, Medicaid, we were able to get a little bit more data into the year. So with Medicare, we saw through the first quarter. But with um, our Medicaid data, we can actually see into July of 2022. And you'll see that by this summer, um, the levels have like gone down quite a bit, but it's hard to see at the bottom, you'll see like almost a flat line. That was the line before the PHE. So that was the number of telehealth services being utilized um, and very, very low. So while there has been a dip in the amount of people who have continued to utilize the telehealth services, it still remains above pre-PHE levels. And then next slide, please. So now, um, like I said, I wanted to spend some time talking about the utilization of telehealth in the IHS and tribal clinics. So specifically, some data that we got from IHS um, was that prior to the PHE, um, IHS was only reporting about less than 1,300 telehealth visits on average each month. Um, and that number drastically grew during the initial surge of COVID during the summer of 2022, or 2020, I apologize. And that's the clinics were seeing on average about 43,000 telehealth visits each month during that summer. So a huge spike in demand of patients at IHS clinics relying on telehealth to receive their care um, from their providers. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. We'll actually get to see all telehealth encounters. Um, and this is um, for all, both IHS and tribal clinics. Um, and you'll see there on the graph, the trends again, spiking um, in 2020 or 20, 20, 2020. My goodness, I'm getting all my dates confused. And as we go into 2022, it has declined, but still remained high. But what I actually wanted to call attention to, because I think this is um, a trend I saw in both the IHS and the tribal clinics um, was the at the bottom of the Excel um, sheet that is um, below the graph, they have it broken down by video only telehealth and phone only telehealth. And of all the telehealth visits, um, month over month, you can see that essentially three quarters of them were via the phone only, the audio only modality, whereas about a quarter of them were on video only. So that just goes to show how important the access to um, audio only telehealth has been for um, beneficiaries using um, the telehealth services through their IHS clinics. So the next slide, please. Um, and I apologize, that was the IHS only. This is the tribal only. Um, here we'll see there's a little bit different um, looking at the Excel document. The graph on the trends look, or the trends on the graph look very similar. Um, but in the tribal clinics, the um, amount of people utilizing video only versus the phone only was actually a little bit higher. Um, it was about a 50 50 split um, throughout the year. So definitely different in um, looking at tribal versus IHS and beneficiaries choosing to use audio only versus a video only source of telehealth. So I wanted to call that out because I did notice that to be an interesting trend. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I wanted to talk about like the future of telehealth developments um, in IHS clinics. And again, thank you to IHS for providing that data and providing these updates um, to see all the efforts being made. It's really awesome. Um, IHS actually awarded a new telehealth system and they're in the implementation planning stage. Um, so 
please, you know, if you have questions about that, we encourage you to reach out to IHS to learn more about what they're doing, but that is the stage they're in and we expect more updates to come in the future. Um, but they have had many ongoing education and outreach efforts that will continue on. Um, they're hosting webinars to both their internal and external partners on the topic of telehealth. They've made many new resources that patients and providers can access when it comes to learning about telehealth. They made an IHS telehealth toolkit, they launched a telehealth website, and they've been engaging um, with IHS providers through surveys to really understand um, how providers are using telehealth and evaluating what do they need, um, again, just to make the um, telehealth more accessible for both providers, patients, everyone as a whole. So um, we look forward to seeing what else IHS continues to do in this realm. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Awesome, thank you. Um, so now that we've gone over some like primers to what telehealth is and how it's been used, I want to spend some time to highlight the telehealth flexibilities that have been put in place. We'll start off with Medicare. Um, so beginning on March 6th of 2020, Medicare began reimbursing for telehealth services um, and they introduced several flexibilities that had never been seen before. Um, so if we can go to the next page, I'll start to cover what those are. Thank you. So the first flexibility that was introduced was the geographic site of the patient. So prior to the PHE, the patient did need to be located in a rural designated area or have their telehealth visit at a healthcare facility to receive the telehealth services. During the PHE, there has been um, a lift on that restriction. So there are no restrictions on where a patient may be located. So it can be a patient who lives in a non-rural area. They can have the telehealth appointment from their home or wherever is most convenient for them. Now related to the modality, um, Pre-PHE, there was only allowed to be the two-way audio-visual, and then like I mentioned, the beginning um, of reimbursing for virtual check-ins and e-visits, um, but during the PHE, um, not only has the, you know, the live video communication has been continued to be allowed, but they have allowed audio only um, for certain visits. Um, so e &M visits, behavioral health, and for different educational services. So not every service has been allowed to be on audio only, but they did allow that for several different um, specialties and services. Next slide, please. Um, so for provider type, prior to the PHE, only doctors, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners were allowed to provide telehealth services during the PHE any enrolled Medicare provider can bill for telehealth services. And this includes um, FQHC and RHC, uh, so federally health, federal qualified health centers and rural health centers during the PHE. And then related to the service type, um, pre-PHE, there was only, uh, there was less than 100 services allowed to be um, administered through telehealth, whereas during the PHE, there's been an expansion of over 250 codes that were approved. Uh, I do have a link on the slides that you can access if you'd be interested in seeing which particular codes were covered. Um, and also note during the PHE that any Medicare approved telehealth service was also allowed to be provided by the FQHC or, IH, or <laughs> RHC um, provider via telehealth. And then the last slide, please. So the last flexibility I'll touch on is reimbursement. Um, so I'll start off what's been allowed during the PHE and then I'll walk you through what um, was during or before the PHE because it's a little complicated. So during the PHE, there's payment parity between in-person visits and telehealth visits, but the payment rate will vary depending on like, where the provider is located. So if a provider is in a non-facility setting, they'll receive a higher rate than a provider in a facility setting. Now, FQHCs and RHCs, they do have a set reimbursement rate of $97.24, um, and that, that rate is determined by the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. So for updates, you can click on that link to see what updated rates will look like. Um, but pre-PHE, and assuming that there is no current changes to the law, once the PHE is designated as over, um, the payment will, will revert to what it used to be. And what it used to be is that um, regardless of whether the service is provided in a facility or a non-facility setting, 
The payment rate will be based on the lower amount paid to a facility-based provider for a service that would be delivered in person. So, you know, that's a little complicated. We have it very fleshed out in the report. Um, and I encourage everyone, if you are con confused about the reimbursement methodology, one, again, it's in the report, but two, please reach out to us and we'll do, you know, our best to clarify and answer any questions. Um, so next slide, please. So now shifting away to what the changes were, um, to what they will be permanently. So um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, um, this issued a change where from now on, unless there's a change in the law, Medicare will reimburse for telehealth services, including the audio only visits for the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of mental health or behavioral health conditions if certain conditions are met, regardless of where the patient is located. Um, so those conditions are that a patient must have seen their provider in person within the last six months, and then they must see their provider at least once per year there on after. If you can go to the next slide, please. Very similarly, um, in the calendar year 2022 Medicare provider fee schedule, a mental health visit for an FQHC or RHC um, it was redefined and now it includes continued coverage of real-time telecommunication visits, including the audio only modality for an established patient who has been seen in person in the last six months and will continue to be seen once in person every 12 months after um, for the Medicare beneficiaries. And I think these two are particularly important to highlight because there was a report released by HHS that looked at telehealth data from 2020, the first year of the PhD. And when they stratified that data and broke it down, I saw that one third of all telehealth visits made by Medicare beneficiaries in that year were for behavioral health visits. So a third of all of the, you know, 28 million people saw their uh, providers on a, a telehealth basis in 2020, but a third of all of those visits were behavioral health and 70% of those behavioral health visits were through an audio only modality. So that year alone just highlighted the need for patients to have access to their behavioral health providers, um, regardless of where they were located and clearly through an audio only modality. So to see these two um, rules be in place and have that access has been, it's really great. And I think the data there shows that it was very necessary. So if we can go into the next slide, um, I'll highlight another change we saw. So the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022 was passed earlier this year. Um, this gives some direction on what things will look like for Medicare telehealth policies once, once the PHE ends. So um, telehealth flexibilities that have been tied exclusively to the PHE, they will be extended for 151 days past the end of the PHE. Now, um, I wanted to note that this act specifically includes the following providers as eligible to continue receiving reimbursement for telehealth for those 151 days. So those are physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language therapists, audiologists, and then FQHC and RHCs. Um, so if, the, those pro, if there are providers that are not on that list, but are maintaining the access to provide telehealth during the PHE in that 151 day period, they will unfortunately will no longer have that access. Now the act also directs um, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, MedPAC, to begin analyzing and evaluating impacts of telehealth expansion and HHS is to release data on that telehealth utilization. So we'll see more data coming out um, that, like I said, we saw a report that covered 2020. And so we can continue seeing data from 2021, 2022 and there on. And just so you all are aware, MedPAC has to make their report to Congress by June, 2023. So um, by next summer, that um, report should be in Congress's hand and hopefully we can see what their findings are. And next slide, please. Awesome. So um, the last thing I want to talk about related to the Medicare telehealth policy is the um, calendar year 2023 physician fee schedule final rule that actually just came out in the beginning of November. 
Um, there were several provisions related to telehealth services. Um, the first one is that um, there will be several temporary telehealth services added um, as a category three basis through the end of 2023. Um, and to define what a category three code is, it's a subset of codes added to the Medicare telehealth service list on a temporary basis during the PHE. Now, please note, there have been several temporary codes um, introduced during the PHE, but if they are not on this list, they will no longer be covered at the end of the 151 days past the PHE when those flexibilities tied to the PHE end. Um, so some examples of services that are going to be added onto this category three list are audiology services, group therapy services, and ophthalmology services. And if you are curious about the full list of those codes, uh, I do have a link in that report that will take you to the, um, the PFS rule, and that way you can see the full list of codes um, that will be on a category three basis through the end of 2023. Um, the second provision is that um, the CMS will implement Medi uh, Medicare telehealth provisions in the 2022 Consolidated Appropriations Act via uh, program instruction or other sub-regulatory guidance, and um, CMS will be working to add a telehealth indicator on clinician group and provider profile pages. That way, if a patient is looking for a Medicare provider that um, does telehealth services, when they're looking through the eligible Medicare uh, provider list, there will be an identifier. So that way a patient can quickly see yes or no, this patient or this provider does or does not offer telehealth services, hopefully making it easier for patients to find a provider that could suit their needs. And then the next slide, please. So that was Medicare. I'm going to take a moment and we're going to pivot over to Medicaid. Um, so we'll look at what states did um, to change their telehealth policies and programs in response to the PHE. Next slide, please. But to give an overview, um, essentially the federal Medicaid approach to telehealth is that they give states a great amount of flexibility to design their telehealth policies. So states have the flexibility to determine what services will be covered, what providers they will cover, what types of technology or those modalities that can be used and how those services will be reimbursed. Now, uh, uh, Medicaid says that services must be provided within a practitioner's scope of practice, um, but also that um, states are not required to submit a separate SPA for coverage or reimbursement of telehealth if they reimburse for the services at the same way and the same amount that they would pay for a face-to-face -face service. So, um, if a state is going to cover, um, let's just say, a behavioral health service, and they're going to reimburse it at the same way, same amount as they would if the patient was going to go in person, they don't need to submit a separate SPA. If a state did want to reimburse differently, they would have to submit a SPA, which is a state plan amendment um, that would have to be reviewed and approved by CMS. And just as a note, disaster relief SPAs generally um, are not necessary if payment is the same, but please pay attention that that could change based on the situation. So it, it's really, it's case by case, but generally a disaster relief spot wouldn't be necessary for um, the same reimbursement. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in the report, I go, I take, <laughs> take you down every state and what they've done during the PHE to change their telehealth programs. Unfortunately, we don't have time to look at all, uh, all of the states today. So I just wanted to give you a high level overview of some of the highlights I noticed. Um, and the number one highlight was that a lot of states allowed for reimbursement of audio only visits. Um, they also greatly expanded what could be covered by telehealth mainly within the realm of behavioral health services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and even teledentistry. That was another popular expansion that I noticed. Oops, thank you. Um, and then I did wanna call out that there um, was a great movement towards payment parity for the in-person and telehealth visits. So prior to the PHE, only 15 states had payment parity laws in place. Um, as of now, 
there, during the PhD, there's been 32 states that have implemented payment parity, but not all of those 32 states um, have made a decision to continue that past the PHE. As of now, there are 26 states who do. So once the PHE is declared over, and we're, you know, we have unwinded, um, as of today, there are 26 states who have said we have payment parity laws on the books, and that means our telehealth and our in-person services for the Medicaid beneficiaries, they will be paid and reimbursed the same. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll actually talk about what else states are doing past the PHE. Um, so the first thing I noticed in my research was that there were actually a lot of telehealth advisory work groups being created. So Arizona, California, Texas, and Idaho all have advisory work groups. Um, you know, they're compiled of different people from different organizations. Um, but the main goal of them is to look at what benefits does telehealth have? Um, how can we keep expanding? Um, the service for our patients. So that's been a really promising thing I saw. And then we saw states like um, Maryland. So um, the Maryland General Assembly passed their Preserve Telehealth Access Act of 2021. And what that act did is it ensured that private insurance and Medicaid coverage for most mental health and substance use disorder services. Um, so it protected those services to be given by telehealth. It allows patients to use audio only modality. It implements payment parity. Um, one thing to note is that they took the approach of we're going to keep the, you know, we're gonna allow that through June 30th of 2023. Um, and then they'll reassess, they'll take, you know, they're gonna collect data and assess if this is something they wanna continue on in the future. Other states have taken similar approaches where they have extended it um, for, you know, a certain amount of time, and then they're going to reevaluate if it's something they want to make permanent past that time. And again, I do have um, information about what states are doing in that report. So if you're curious about what your state might be doing, if I found anything, it'll be in there. Um, but then lastly, a lot of the State Department of Health and um, the uh, state Medicaid agencies have begun communicating and issuing guidance related to what permanent telehealth policies they're going to be having that will remain at the end of the PHG. So it's been really great too to see states just proactively making decisions, even though we still are in a PHG, um, to decide that, hey, we're going to make these changes regardless. Once the PHG is over, they're going to stay. Um, again, I think just seeing that telehealth has been a very um, positive benefit for many people. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so obviously, like I just said, a lot of states have been issuing that guidance, um, but some states are still in the midst of making those changes and figuring out what they would like to do. Um, so CMS has developed a toolkit and a supplemental toolkit um, to help states um, make those decisions. So. Some examples of what's in the toolkits are um, for states to decide what policies are we gonna keep temporary or what are we gonna make permanent? Um, when will we decide that flexibilities are gonna expire? How are we gonna determine what services and providers we want to keep eligible for telehealth? And what type of modalities do we wanna keep eligible? Um, so I have both of those linked and they're also in the report. And that way um, you all can take a look at them and see what might be helpful if you are um, you know, in, engaging with the states about like designing those telehealth programs. There's some really useful information um, in those toolkits to help spur those thoughts. And um, we can go to the next page, please. Thank you. So that was that was it for Medicaid. Um, now I want to shift over to talking about resources and work groups um, that I think have been very important within the realm of telehealth. So just to let you all know, within the um, federal government, there is a group called FedTel. It is a cross-federal work group, and so there are members from CMS, IHS, HRSA, CDC. Um, AHRQ, and basically they, they were founded in 2011, so they've been around for quite a bit of time, but they were comprised so that way these agencies could come together and develop a coordinated approach as to what the federal government is doing with telehealth and what it's going to look like. So that's been a very engaging uh, group to be a part of and just see the different conversations um, about, you know, how are we going to move forward with the um, development of telehealth at the federal level. Um, 
the National Cancer Institute actually um, just was awarded um, by the NIH, the National Institute of Health, um, $23 million to establish and support four different centers that are committed to conducting research that is related to telehealth and cancer patients. Um, so it's a part of the Telehealth Research Centers of Excellence, that's TCI, or TRC, sorry. Um, the NCI, and it is a part of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Um, so I thought that was very interesting because that looks at a very um, specific group of patients who, especially when they may be going through cancer treatment, are immunocompromised, but may need access not only for um, clinical reasons with their providers, but those mental health and support reasons as they're going through health challenges and making sure that um, they're this um, group of people is being invested in and how we can grow telehealth to meet their needs and hopefully expand and um, make their those health journeys better. Um, so that work is really cool and I linked it there for you all to read up on if you're interested. I found it really interesting. Um, and then another um, partner um, is called the Center for Connected Health Policy. It's, um, it's basically a I, it's not a think tank, but I look at it like that because it's just a bunch of brilliant people running this um, center all about telehealth. And so they have one stop shop for all different resources, all different information, but they oversee the National Telehealth Resource Center. That's the TRC. And um, they have 12 regional groups in the TRC and two national groups. And I highly recommend looking at what they do because they host events and webinars, they provide resources and they provide technical assistance to organizations who reach out who may need help with their telehealth programs. Um, Cause they're very committed to getting telehealth programs up and running in rural and underserved communities across the country. So it's a fantastic group. Like I said, I highly recommend not only just to look at what they're offering but to hopefully engage with them as well. And then the next slide, please. So I wanted to just briefly, um, you know, touch on the fact that there are a lot of health equity implications um, with telehealth, because as we know, it could, like I said many times, it greatly expands the access um, for patients to connect with their providers. Um, but there are barriers that patients may face when accessing telehealth. Um, number one being they may not have access to internet or technology that connects them to their providers. Um, some people may not have a safe space to have those conversations with their providers. And there also may be language barriers. So I know I actually worked in a health clinic before I came to CMS and we did telehealth and our online portals only were in English and Spanish. And so if we had a patient who wasn't fluent in either of those languages, it could be a barrier for them to fill out their forms, read the health disclosures. You know, we had to rely on having a translator or them having someone that could read for them and translate it into their language. So I say that just as healthcare providers, you know, being sure that when we're uh, the telehealth programs are created and the systems that are being used, those patient portals, making sure that they are equitable and accessible for, you know, variety of people. Um, so I did just want to um, make <laughs> that statement because like I said, I know telehealth is an incredible tool, but we want to make sure it's accessible by everyone. So moving on to the next slide, um, focusing on that broadband and technology piece, um, I wanted to shout out that through the CARES Act, there was $140 million in grant funding that was dedicated to increase the telehealth and broadband funding efforts um, in tribal communities in 2021. Um, so there were um, over $16 million in grants um, given to 57 tribes, which those tribes are listed on the, um, the link on the page through the Rural um, Tribal COVID-19 Response Program that HRSA led. And then the USDA, um, they had two different um, programs for um, tribal um, clinics and organizations and that they got over $125 million out in grants through the distance learning and telemedicine grant program and the reconnect broadband grant program. So um, a lot of good funding going to communities who need the money to get their broadband up to speed and get these telehealth programs in place. And so the next slide will actually talk about the future funding opportunities because that is obviously very important. Um, so 
the Tribal T Connectivity Technical Amendments Program. This is administered by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. So the NTIA actually already has a tribal broadband connectivity program that has an existing $1 billion in funding. But this secondary program was um, created and received is receiving $2 billion in funding through the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so the um, tribal connectivity technical amendments uh, program actually was created to strengthen the existing program. And so some things it does is it relaxes the time requirements of the existing program. It allows grantees to use up to 2.5% of their project costs for planning, feasibility, and sustainability studies. And um, any unused project funds um, are now allowed to be kept by the organization who's received the money and use it towards other tribal broadband projects within the community rather than going back to the treasury. So if they receive a grant and they let's say they have 25,000 left over rather than giving it back they can use it towards other um, broadband projects so that's really awesome i've linked the ntia's um, page both on this and our report you can go there to keep up with when they'll be announcing and releasing the applications for that grant um, but as of now they've been saying it'd be early 2023 um, so i just encourage you all if that's something you feel like you and your community may want to apply for to keep up with them and if you have any questions um, i can get you in contact with the right team over there um, and we can make sure that you all have all the right information to potentially apply for that and then the last slide, I think, yeah, <laughs> um, that was it. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I know Michaela is going to open it up for questions in a moment, but if you have a question um, that we don't get to or you think about it later, my information is on the slide. Please feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to find an answer for you and get your needs taken care of. So thank you again. Thank you, Abigail. Um... At this time, if you have any questions, can you you can please place those questions in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen, or you can use the raise hand function, and we can unmute your line and you can ask your question out loud. Okay, we have one question just about can you share the link where we can go in order to obtain the presentation. Um, so yes, we can put this in there again as well, but um. The recording will be placed on go.cms.gov slash AIAN. And if there are any other questions at this time, you can place them in the Q&A box and we can answer them, or you can use the raise hand feature and you can ask those questions out loud too. So Abby and Beverly, I'm not seeing any questions come through at this time. Um, if you'd like, we can give it a few more minutes. Okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Abby, for a great presentation. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Very thorough. That's why there's no questions. <laughs> I tried my best. <laughs> <laughs> great job. Okay, so with that said, it looks like we don't have any additional questions. Um, we did have questions about the presentation and the report and the webinar. All of that, again, can be found at our website, which is go.cms.gov slash AIAN. Okay, so I would like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. And I, um, as always, I want to let you know that you can submit any inquiries to the CMS Division of Tribal Affairs at our mailbox. And that mailbox is tribalaffairs at cms.hhs.gov. So if you run into any questions that you have, feel free to um, send it to that mailbox. And also, as Abby mentioned, she put her email right here on the slide, this last slide here. So um, if you have specific questions for Abby, just send her an email. Um, with that said, thank you so much and have a great day. <laughs>